Hey guys, it's Paul, combat veteran, MMA fighter, YouTuber, and today we are checking out a much, much requested item. This is Arch Warhammer's first video on the Siege of Vrax. Let's get into it. The Siege of Vrax. In any other sci-fi or fantasy universe, the battle for Vrax would be the catastrophe the heroes are fighting to avoid. The battle itself would be the apocalyptic ending of the story in meaningless bloodshed and horror. I mean, the entire Warhammer 40k universe is meaningless bloodshed and horror. Heroes are reduced to nothing more than meat with which to feed the furnace of endless slaughter. In any other universe, the city undergoing a horrible siege and facing insurmountable odds might be compared with the plight of Gondor or the fall of Orsgard during the Ragnarok. The defenders are facing an enemy that possesses a complete disregard for their own lives. An enemy that simply hurls themselves against the walls again and again until their very bodies create a ramp upon which to climb. The city's populace face an enemy that seek to eradicate every man, woman, and child within the walls, even at the cost of their own lives. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 do, I don't know much about the Siege of Rex, but I know he's talking about our friends, the Death Corps of Krieg. In any other universe, the city's defenders would be the heroes. And this would be their last stand. Their final hour, their apocalypse. 40k, this is reality. <laughs> sort of. But I see what he means. This is just this is just another day in old 40k. It's day to day because you see not only is this not the end, this is the norm. This is the day to day existence for millions for 17 years. And the good guys, they're the ones trying to break in to the city. So are we hyped? Are we excited? We are finally here now, the Siege of Vrax. I've been teasing this one for quite a while, but one last little thing before we get started. I would like to once again just thank everybody who's been watching my channel for the last few years, and my patrons in particular. This video series simply would not be possible without all of you guys, so once again, thank you all so much. And now, without further ado, let's get into the Siege of Vrax. So one thing I want to say that's interesting is his perspective on the siege being basically an unmitigated disaster. What's fascinating is that that is actually what a lot of commentators considered the First World War to be. Um, you know, there was a sense at the time that the great powers were in a precarious balance with one another. Uh, these were, of course, the great powers of, of Russia, uh, France, the UK, uh, Germany. And this balance was obvious to almost every in intelligent observer uh, that it was completely unstable, that it would be extremely difficult uh, to maintain the status quo. And there was a sense of that some of these great powers were declining, like Austro-Hungary and Turkey. There was a sense that some powers were rising, like the United Kingdom. And there was a sense that some powers were in a zero-sum game, Russia and Germany, for example. And... It, Again, among a lot of observers, they expected a, a great European war to erupt. What they did not expect was for industrialization to have so fundamentally changed the nature of war. This is, of course, the fact that previous European wars, and the last one of substance was, I think, 1880, that for 40 years... They only could only look back at the old style of great power war. And 40 years prior, the 1880s, I mean, you saw the earliest introduction of the repeating infantry rifle. And this, you know, you still had marching formations. 
You still had offensives that were, you know, a, a, a hundred, you know, men marching abreast. So the shock of how much industrialization had changed warfare was almost traumatizing for these countries. Again, imagine having basically revolutionary war tactics and going up against the, the you know, a, a civil war style of fighting. It would be uh, an unmitigated disaster. And it's also interesting that the American Civil War should have been an indicator for a lot of European powers of what this new industrial age warfare was trending towards. You notice that the American Civil War's later battles often featured really robust earthworks. They featured repeating rifles. They featured offensives that were absolute massacres. And, of course, none of the European armies, nor did really the American army at the time, take these trends and were able to meaningfully forecast them. Right, so all this to say, the idea of a war that is the worst case scenario for at least a planet or a country or its people is not so far-fetched and without historical precedent. The Battle for Vrax was to prove one of the bloodiest single planet campaigns ever fought by the Death Corps of Krieg. And considering their own bloody civil war almost wiped their planet off the face of the galaxy, that's saying something. And yet, this monstrous campaign of slow, grinding, meticulous, painful attrition and bloodshed that was to last for 17 years and claim the lives of tens of millions of loyalists and traitors alike was all started with the death of one single frail old man. Ah, this is... Uh, okay, I'm already hearing some echoes of good old World War One. As you know, that was started with the assassination of the Austro-Hungarian prince, Franz Ferdinand, uh, which, no, uh, uh, yeah, I think so, by, like, a Serbian nationalist, and that set off a series of alliances that pulled Russia into a war with, uh, Aus with Serbia, no, a war with Austro-Hungary to support its ally, Serbia, who then triggered a war with who then triggered Germany to enter the war. I'm sorry, I'm probably butchering the history. Um, obviously, uh, history experts that have the exact timeline and the exact network of alliances <laughs> let me know. Um, but when all the treaties had been triggered, the uh, you had Germany facing off against both Russia and France. Right, surrounded on all sides. Though, to be certain, it was well and truly his time. The man was Cardinal Astral Borgia, and he had lived until the ripe old age of 400 years. Uh, though, perhaps saying he had lived until that age might be an overly optimistic interpretation. His body, more so than the man, had been kept alive well beyond the limits of human endurance but the technology of the Adeptus Mechanicus. The Cardinal had not left his palace for 200 years, and his bed for well over half of that time. At the end, his spiritless husk was kept alive by constant blood transfusions and barely understood machinery. Nevertheless, his passing was mourned by billions across the subsector, and was also the starting shot for the ensuing power struggle to fill the vacuum left behind by his death. The man who would eventually rise to fill that power vacuum was a competitively young man by the name of Zaphon. Uh, this is actually a very interesting, uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to say problem, but it's really common to see when you have very charismatic leaders struggling for power in a sudden power vacuum. The two examples that are most most come to mind is first off the United States and its and to a lesser extent like Mexico and Colombian governments um, who 
will target the heads of drug cartels, believing that when you destroy the head of a cartel, that the cartel itself will crumble and become no longer a threat. In reality, however, what often happens much more frequently is that the single cartel leader had so much power and control that absent that, a number of ambitious lieutenants underneath him would attempt to seize control of the entire organization, and they would fight among themselves. The result, of course, are usually horrific increases in deaths, shooting deaths, massacres, as these sides tend to shoot it out, trying to assert dominance and regain the empire that unfortunately just one single person, almost always a man, sat atop. The other, of course, classic example is the uh, USSR after the death of Lenin. Uh, After Lenin died, of course, there were a number of competing figures that had been prominent in the revolution, and they all wanted to see themselves at the helm of this new Soviet state. However, the problem with both of these systems, the cause of the issue, is that without a proper succession plan in place, when the leader dies, you do not select for the best manager, you do not select for the person who is most like the deceased, you select for the person who is willing to do anything, cross any line to achieve power. Because as long as there is a place that your opponents will not go, that you will go, you can best them. And so the result, almost always, is that egomaniacs with zero regard for human life are the ones who win these power struggles. Because they can do the things and go to the places that no other person with a moral code can. And you see the results. Again, the Decades of horrific cartel violence in many of the countries where cartels are forced into chaos. And, of course, you see it in the bloody and horrific reign of Joseph Stalin, the person who emerged from that post-Lenin Soviet power struggle. A favored student of the old cardinal. Upon his elevation to the rank of cardinal, he declared he would go on a pilgrimage of the areas now under his spiritual rule, for he had never before seen the places or the billions he must now guide. The pilgrimage would take a full five years, stopping by the various imperial shrines of importance in the subsector. Along with him traveled what was, by Adeptus Ministorum leadership standards, a humble entourage of some 1,000 souls. Mostly preachers, deacons, servants, and the likes, including a personal bodyguard of Adeptus Sororitas, the feared and ever-faithful sisters of battle. His entourage, however, quickly grew far beyond the starting 1,000, as various groups, cults more like, attached themselves to it. They loudly proclaimed that the Cardinal's pilgrimage was a holy crusade, figuratively rather than violently, at the moment at least, to rid the sector of heresy, purge, and to judge the impure, and bring salvation to the faithful. It's important to understand just what a big deal this was. In many of the places the Cardinal visited, his arrival and the subsequent speeches made drew crowds of hundreds of thousands, occasionally millions of people, often to improvised venues never intended to hold anything like those numbers. It was far from unusual for large-scale riots to break out as people fought just to get a glimpse of the new cardinal. This often necessitated a rather harsh response from the cardinal's bodyguards in order to keep him safe. Suffice to say, the Sisters of Battle fired their bolters on full auto into more than one crowd of people. You can imagine the effect of that. A dozen or so fully automatic grenade launchers firing into a throng of human beings about salvation, but the Cardinal certainly brought judgment to quite a few people. His uh, pilgrimage... Yeah, it's always fascinating to see the way that human beings tend to deify 
celebrities of all sorts. And I, I, you know, I don't believe in imperial lore, and I trust the lore experts to weigh in on this, that in the way that a priest in the Catholic Church does not have superhuman abilities, they are not born with some special blessing. They are more or less regular people that are allowed by the church to engage in certain rites, right? They do not have divine powers and are not subjects of worship the way a saint might be. And I imagine it's similar for the imperial cult, despite the fact that, of course, the emperor was obviously a, a, a devout atheist, sort of. And so it, it stands to reason that the cardinals in the imperial cult would not actually pres- describe themselves as having a superhuman or supernatural or religious power. So, but of course, human beings, being what they are, they want to believe that such people exist. They want to believe that there is someone who is perfect and pure and without flaw and perceptive and sees the world in a in a in a great and deep and rich way that uh, that the downtrodden masses of regular humans cannot and of course without fail as we see in in today's world uh more clearly perhaps than than in times past that people are flawed sometimes often horrifically so every single person and i'm sure every single person watching this would undoubtedly if if with a if their past were to be gone through with a fine enough comb, you would find that that one off-color joke that you posted on Facebook in 2006, you know, you would find that that uh, that one drawing you did as a kid that was actually pretty offensive, right? This is the nature of things, right? But human beings want so much to have someone who is, like, perfect. And I think it's extra true when your daily life is one of deprivation and desperation and suffering, I think the promise that someone offers that your current life is not the end-all be-all is really appealing when your current life is so, so, so very hard. ...was causing a fair bit of trouble around the subsector, but what about Zaphon himself? How did he feel about all of this? Perhaps he was repulsed by the violence done in his name. Perhaps he had never thought his pilgrimage would come to this. He could even say that he had never asked for this. Except, of course, he had. Zaphon was far too driven and experienced a man of the cloth not to know the effect his mere presence could have on the people of the Imperium. And now that many were calling him a messiah, the true herald of the Emperor himself, there could be no doubt. His pilgrimage was not only just and correct, it was necessary. Back on the cardinal world, he would have wasted hours debating every minutia with his council. Little, if any, of the Emperor's true work would be done. But out here? Out amongst the masses? Here, his words held real weight. With but a whisper, he could raise armies. With his shouted voice, he could topple planetary governors. Here, amongst the true faithful, not the make-believe believers of the cardinal world, he could create miracles. And why shouldn't he? He was a just man, a pious man, chosen by the Emperor. It was clear for all to see. Ah, uh, yes. I, you know, it's actually difficult to understand what drives this certain subset of person. This person that drinks their own Kool-Aid about being some level of of messianic influence on the world. It's, again, you have to think that my position is that for 99.9% of people, there is an enough. There is a point in which you are pra- in which you have power or adoration or money or prestige 
that is sufficient. At which point, the tremendous monumental effort required to get to that next tier of, say, wealth or prestige or power simply is no longer worth it. Right. I mean, again, you think of the 80 something year old politicians, right? That's the quintessential example for me who must be so tired, so exhausted, often facing significant illnesses. And yet the idea that they can claw out just a little more power is so compelling to them. And it's hard for me to understand. Um, but there is some sort of psyche at work there. And it sounds like this is a guy who also, again, in a fictionalized version of that same person who just was so addicted to the adoration and the praise and the worship that he only could want more. He could never step down. Even his closest advisors encouraged his actions, though, they also provided him with a warning. There might be those out there with narrower minds than his own. Men who in their deplorable ignorance might mistake his glory's purpose for such base emotions as lust for power. Ridiculous as that may, of course, be. Nevertheless, it pays to be prepared, and Zaphon now envisioning a glorious war of faith to sweep the whole sector clean of heresy could not risk the interference of some close-minded inquisitor. How to prepare, though? Due to ancient edicts, the Adeptus Ministorum was banned from maintaining any men under arms, therefore precluding, of course, the keeping of a standing army. The Sisters of Battles were themselves a clever circumvention of that very edict, but their numbers were limited. Just want to point... This is a really, this is a point that bothers me immensely. Is there is an edict post emperor that says that you can't have men under arms. And it's fairly clear that the intent is that the church may have no armed forces. But here's, and yet the church believes they have found a loophole by putting women under arms. But here's the thing. Who, it implies that there is a neutral party doing contract enforcement. That the, Imper the greater Imperium or the High Lords of Terra want a disarmed church. And the church thinks, hey, we can have any army we want. And someone, there is some sort of contract dispute resolution body that the Imperium's High Lords defer to. But obviously such a thing doesn't exist. The Imperium is dictatorial. And so it, 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 I know people are like, oh, it's a technicality. But there are only technicalities when there is a universally recognized law and an arbiter of that law. Does that make sense? Right? Because ultimately, uh, you know, pick your authoritarian country. Um, you know, we'll use China as an example. The law price says you can't kill somebody in china you can't kidnap them but the government doesn't have to respect that law they can kidnap any political dissident they want and they they don't have to because there is no body that can hold the government the the communist party and its government to account so again this is this is like a lore and consistency is what i'm describing and the adeptus sororitas are a you know cool looking faction they got that sick armor um, but it's just a, a minor pet peeve that it implies the existence of something that doesn't exist in lore. And the Inquisition's resources were anything but. And it stood to reason, Safin's trusted advisors told him, that the Inquisition had already infiltrated his faithful hordes. Uh, there were always weak-willed individuals to be exploited by the nefarious agents of the Inquisition. And clear as day, as Safin's holy mission might be, there were always someone who were too blind to see. After all, had not the Emperor himself once been betrayed? The Cardinal's ambitions were too grand. He would have to take some precautions. And ably helped along by his most faithful advisor, Deacon Mamoun, he set about the creation of an inner circle. A group of faithful 
fully vetted and appropriately surveilled at all times, at least any waver in their faith, followers. And then, of course, this group, along with the Cardinal, would need a new home. The Cardinal world was not fitting for his grand ambitions. He needed somewhere secluded, somewhere out of the way, so as not to draw unwanted attention, but simultaneously close enough to be forever within reach of the primary worlds of the subsector and, of course, the Cardinal's own spies. Nay, not spies, but those who are of pure faith and whose presence would in turn ensure the continued faithfulness of their charges. Luckily, there was just such a place within easy reach, the world of Vrax. It was home to the massive basilica of Saint Leonis the Blind. Yeah, the inner circle concept is very interesting. So when authority or authoritarian figures take power, often the way these power struggles play out when they're not coups is that it becomes a competition not to build your own inner circle but some certainly do that but to instead install loyalists into positions of importance especially positions that carry the weight of well that carry political weight these are usually the apartment that the departments that oversee things like your police your military sometimes your justices and by appointing loyalists to those positions right once you get a certain plurality of key positions then and you know for sure that the people around you will be loyal as as their defining and sole trait then you can effectively start to force out your opponents again you control the department of justice again, or your Ministry of Justice, or whatever your country calls it, then you can start to use it as a weapon against your political opponents. If you control the department of the military or the army, then you can use that to purge people who are disloyal, disloyal officers, uh, even just generals who may not, whose loyalty may not be absolute, but who are a little too charismatic, so it's interesting to see that this person created his own inner circle separate from the existing power structures of his uh, cardinalship. It's not the ecclesiarchy. Within his diocese, I'll use the Catholic Church term, within his diocese, he chooses to create his own inner circle. Usually these things are less formalized. Right, so you would install people, your loyalists, to key positions that are already existing, and then you would rely heavily on their counsel, and you would exclude those non-loyalists. You would draw resources away from them and put resources into the departments that are staffed by your loyalists. Again, your goal being to get the largest share of power that ultimately traces up to you and that will allow you to consolidate it further by forcing out rivals martyred in the 38th millennia the cardinal would take up residence in the adjoining palaces to take a moment of respite and to organize the rest of his pilgrimage nothing could be more natural he had been on the road for years and it was about time for a quick little breather and best of all, the world was an Adeptus Administratum world under the auspices of the Munitorum. The Administratum had always been a dreadfully close-minded and suspicious organization as far as the Adeptus Ministorum was concerned, and Zaphon found considerable delight in making his plans right underneath their very noses. To further enhance the subterfuge, he made all the proper arrangements, Vrax was, after all, an armory world, used to store the vast quantities of military material used by the Imperial Guard across the sector. To protect these stores, Vrax had also become a fortress world who had withstood several attempts to assault and besiege it in its long history. As such, it was quite obviously a sensitive world, and travel to and from Vrax was highly restricted. 
But the Cardinal had friends in all the right places. Besides, his position quite literally meant he owned the Basilica and all the attached structures. Even if the Administratum wanted to prevent him to travel to Vrax, there would hardly be any sufficient reason to stop him or to deny the Cardinal's requests. Nevertheless, it greatly amused the Cardinal to undergo all the proper steps, even insisting on the vetting process, to make sure that everything was above board. Every successful test cleared boosted his self-confidence, and in his eyes, he was outsmarting the dull-witted drones of the Administratum at every turn. And finally, after all the formalities, all the procedures, and all... Ah, uh, this is also very common. Calling in favors to get special treatment. And at the end of the day, any sort of vetting process is only as good as the people who are empowered to scrutinize it. If there's no realistic chance that you will, say, fail a background check, then there is, of course, no danger in receiving a background check. In fact, it politically looks even better to do so. And of course, if you are the Cardinal with hundreds of thousands or millions of very angry followers with a strong track record of being willing to uh, do serious harm, then even the administratum personnel probably understand that if they value their lives, they will allow this high, high ranking, high prestige official to travel to Vrax. All of the checks, his arrival was greeted with grand celebration, all the pomp and ceremony that Vrax could muster. Along with the Cardinal came thousands of staffs and tens of thousands of various followers, including within them considerable groupings of armed followers, essentially militia-like groups that had formed around the Cardinal and his ever more um, confrontational, shall we say, rhetoric. The Cardinal made his pilgrimage to the Basilica and then withdrew to his private palaces. Ah, uh, this is another classic move. This is extremely common in authoritarian countries. The unrecognized armed groups. Now, it's hard when you are any country, right? I mean, take take your pick. Venezuela, Russia, and when you have these pesky laws and uniformed security forces and strict regulations, then it's hard sometimes to deal with uh problems opposition people and so an easy solution that many many authoritarians settle on is to have informal armed militia now sometimes these are referred to as different things sometimes they're very formalized they would be say a party right your political party but sometimes it's very informal sometimes it's just a officially a football club but what you need them for is to do dirty work. Let's say there's a protest against one of your governors, let's say, or a protest against one of your uh, policies. Well, what you can do, you can't have your security forces arrest all these peaceful protesters. That, that's a, not going to work, right? The international community will be outraged and it will backfire because the media will pick it up, people will see uniformed security forces tear gassing and wailing on protesters. It's just a bad look. So instead, what is a much more viable solution for the authoritarian is to have groups, we'll call them counter protesters, that go into uh, these protests and with, you know, Either will shout them down, hit them with bats, uh, sometimes in some pl cases shoot at them. In some like Eastern European countries, we've seen this sort of thing. Um, yeah, 
And this is the sort of behavior that allows you as the leader to go, hey, these protests have turned violent, right? You don't need to describe which, which, what exactly has happened. You say these protests have turned violent, people are getting hurt, and here's the best part. One, not only do you get to have plausible deniability, but you get to say in the wake of these violent protests, we need to clamp down on some rights to protest. These have gotten out of hand, and so we are going to suspend people's right to protest in the street because of the violence. And of course, officially, no one's realized that the authoritarian themselves are the ones that created the violence. So it's a win-win, right? The authoritarian looks like a strong, decisive leader in the face of lawless violence in the streets. The opposition is beaten and cowed into submission. And, of course, you are able to assert further control over the country. Well, he remained unavailable for further audiences due to his ongoing spiritual contemplations. The nature of these contemplations, however, were far more immaterial than spiritual. The Cardinal was preparing for his great war of faith, but to wage a war, one must necessarily have an army. And the Ministorum was, of course, banned from such things, but, fortuitously, like with all things, there was a loophole. The Basilica of St. Leonis on Vrax was entitled to raise a Frateris militia in times of need to protect itself. As the name suggests, the Frateris militia is a group of armed individuals that form a sort of army, in a way, under the temporary command of the Adeptus Ministorum, and this can circumvent the edict barring them from having any men under arms, since the Frateris Militia can be made up of anyone and everyone. It also harkens back to back in the day before the Age of Apostasy, before the decree that banned the Ministorum from having an army. Back then, the military arm of the Ministorum was known as the Frateris Templars, and the Frateris Militia is but the palest shadow of the once incredible military might of the Church of the God Emperor. But one of course has to start somewhere, and a militia, whilst not necessarily an army in and of itself, was certainly a start, and there was no actual limitation or restrictions upon the size or composition of the Frateris militia that the Basilica might raise in times of need. The only problem... See, again, this is a loophole that makes sense because clearly there is the larger Imperium, right, at the, uh, let's say, segmentum level that would adjudicate these sort of debates between the local ministorum, the local uh, administratum, planetary governors, subsector rulers... Right, there's almost certainly a robust dispute resolution process at the next level up. And so therefore, loopholes and technicalities can actually be exploited because there's a neutral arbiter at the top. It only, when there's no more neutral arbiters, then, and a th power cannot be, and questions cannot be kicked up to higher levels, that is when loopholes stop because, of course, if you're not accountable to anybody, you don't need to follow written laws or contracts. You just do whatever you want. ...was with the end of that sentence, times of need. There was currently no need, not on Vrax, nor in the solar system, nor even in the subsector as a whole. It was all remarkably quiet and stable. For a change, in 40k, the closest war zone was many, many warp months away, so the Cardinal would have a somewhat hard time making it out as if some imminent threat was about to descend upon Vrax, but such a small thing as the truth should never be enough to stop men of real talent and foresight. What is, after all, one small innocent lie today measured against the gains of tomorrow. And so the Cardinal's deacons and priests walked amongst the people and laborers of Rux 
telling them of a great impending threat. Already, planets on the periphery of the system were falling to a tide of heretical monstrosities. Time was short indeed, and they had to take up arms swiftly in just crusade to safeguard their holy world. Soon, thousands had joined the Fratellus militia, and many more joined the Cardinal's various other armed groups of followers. And Ah, this is this is interesting. So it's actually pretty tough to manufacture a real military threat out of whole cloth. But what's much easier, and in the current age of social media, extremely easy, is to manufacture people that hate you. Or, another way to think of it, manufacture the idea that there is a large group of people who want to destroy you and this is easy to do because when you have a any large enough group of people or category of people there are always going to be one or two extremists right one or two or you know we're, we'll say the bottom half of a percent right which sounds like you know the most extreme Again, point half a percentile, which means one in every 200 people. So if you're talking about a category of a million people, then you'll be able to point to actually, oh, what's that? A thousand examples, something like that, 500, right? So a category of a million people, you could point to literally a different extremist every single day for over a year. Pretty incredible. Right? And that's how you can mobilize someone. And as long as every time you spread the rumor that these extremists are actually representative, that they are the only ones saying out loud the things that everyone in this given group actually believes, then that's an easy way to mobilize people who maybe already have these latent beliefs. Right? Maybe they're already a little suspicious of this other and then you tell them you hold up these examples of the other, the other's most extreme, most ridiculous examples. And you say, look, look at this. The other people, this is an, a typical example of how they think, feel, and act. And of course, no one, nothing gets anyone worked up and loyal to your side like a good external threat. And so out of nowhere, you've taken something pretty innocuous, a million people who have no particular desire to harm anyone else, and you found, the, and by using those fringe examples, you are able to create the perception that a group of people, that a different group of people are under tremendous threat. It's pretty deceptive and... This isn't a political channel, but I, there's actually, actually, there's a lot of evidence that this happens in a huge number of countries for various purposes. And it's pretty horrific every time it happens. Speaking of followers, Deacon Mamoon had persuaded the Cardinal to establish a true inner circle, a inner circle within the inner circle, because, of course, this one would be made up of only his most ardent and zealous followers. Rather than being made up of officials and priests, it would primarily contain the leaders of the various armed groups that had sworn themselves to the Cardinal. They would also begin the formation of a trusted body of loyal men under arms, known as the Disciples of Zaphon, in clear violation of the Edict. Members of... Ah, oh, this is pretty realistic, yeah. Usually taking what were previously informal relationships between the authoritarian and his informal armed groups and making them explicit is generally one of the last steps before full, well, full seizure of power. So again, this is, I, I wonder if this is drawn from a real example. I, I have an idea of one in history that I believe this is sort of tracking with, but I'm curious to see where this goes. Fax's ruling elite were also introduced into the fringes of this inner circle, though mostly by promises of monetary compensation and power rather than faith. You know, it's always funny how the, the decision that is financially the best 
for someone is also the one that God wants for them. It's a miracle. It's truly incredible the number of times, you know, God, look at all the, the, the like shady preachers who are like, oh, guys, God wants me to minister from a private jet. It's just a bit, a business class is just not good enough for me, the power, the, 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 you know, the messenger of God, right? I need to, you know, or I need to drive in a Bentley. The church, God wants me to show my holiness by driving in a Bentley. It's, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's horrible, but it's, it's just hilarious. And it's so consistent. It's almost perfectly consistent that God wants you to do whatever is going to benefit you anyway. Those who could not be enticed were swiftly removed or accidented out of the way and replaced by those who could. Ooh. Looks like I know what I'm talking about. And within a frighteningly short span of time, Zaphon had essentially established full control over Vrax's military as well as administration. This also seems an opportune time to point out that a considerable portion of Vrax's population were essentially slaves. Mostly convicts placed in a heavy guard and chained together, forced to work in vast quarries breaking rock and working on the ever-expanding fortifications on Vrax. The Cardinal's preachers begun walking amongst these wretched souls and promising them salvation, a way out, a redemption for their crimes, or at the very least improve the living conditions for the moment. If they were to join the Frateris militia, their day-to-day -day chores would be lessened and they might even be given extra rations to make life, although not exactly comfortable, at the very least somewhat more bearable. Now, of course... The number of starving people you can recruit with extra rations to a cause never fails to amaze me. There's got to be a million examples in history. As a part of the Frateris militia, even though it was currently quote-unquote mobilizing in times of need, this wasn't really a standing militia. Obviously, handing out weapons to a slave population is never a particularly good idea. They were given the absolute bare minimum in the way of military training and told to exercise with wooden replicas of auto guns. And as for shooting training, well, uh, yeah. Interesting and sort of scary. Pre-World War II, you can actually find online, there's several pictures of U.S. military, U.S. Army soldiers training on wooden uh, facsimiles of machine guns. Uh, I, I, and I believe, I believe at some periods of like the Spanish civil war towards the end, um, they also had military conscripts for the Republican side also forced to train with wooden weapons. Oh, oh, there's an even better example because, because, of EU regulations. The EU has said, hey, we're going to provide military assistance to the democratically elected government of, I think, the Congo. I believe it's the Congo. Commenters, let me know. But because of the onerous burden of actually sending live weapons to the government, those trainers made the Congolese military, who are fighting a lethal insurgency, I, I really think I... I'm pretty sure I'm correct in the country, but if I get it wrong, commenters, please let me know. The EU cannot get them weapons for their trainers, and so they train on wooden weapons, despite the fact that, again, they're fighting a dangerous and lethal insurgency, and the EU thinks they're helping by sending trainers with no weapons. Of course, in this ineffective power vacuum uh russia stepped in had their trainers provide much greater uh equipment training uh and of course are exerting their influence in the sub-saharan african well subcontinent yeah it didn't happen much let's just say but nevertheless the fraternity militia on vrax 
was growing exponentially and far beyond the remits of the treaty considering there were absolutely nothing in the way of any actual threat anywhere nearby and this rather swiftly got the attention of a certain imperial organization. Despite the Cardinal's misgivings, he had for the most part been flying underneath the radar so far. But the invoking of the defense treaty of the Basilica of St. Leonis, that had caught the attention of the Ordo Hereticus, the least tolerant of all the inquisitorial orders, and that is saying something. That makes them by far the blackest of all of the kettles in the cupboard. And they were particularly famed for their somewhat extreme solutions to various problems. In this case, this was a problem they had seen all too often before. A sheltered cardinal gets a glimpse of the real world, he escapes however momentarily from his gilded cage, and suddenly he starts getting ideas, delusions of grandeur, and thinks that he can change the world. And oddly enough, said ideas of worldly revolution almost always involves vast quantities of weapons and men trained to use them. You would think that at least one of these cardinals would simply decide to open a chain of soup kitchens or something, but no, armed insurrection it usually is. What did I tell you? Who wins power struggles? Who's going to become the powerful cardinal? The person willing to do anything to achieve that next level of power, right? All the, car all the cardinals that would open soup kitchens, they look at what they would have to do to win a power struggle and they say it's not worth it it's not worth it maybe they realize that that this person they're competing with is kind of a sociopath and would kill them in a heartbeat and they say you know what i'll just go back to my parish and i will open a little soup kitchen there right again it's only the people that will do anything for power that win and that's why they ascend and as arch pointed out they always seem to raise armies Granted, the Cardinal hadn't technically made himself guilty of this, yet, but he was clearly heading in that general direction, and the Ordo Hereticus is not an organization overly fond of taking chances, nor are they particularly famed for betting on the better nature of mankind. And so, orders were issued to ensure that Cardinal Zaphon would never make the ultimate mistake. And they would ensure this by cutting his reign somewhat short. The irony of it all is, of course, that up until this point, the Inquisition hadn't really paid too much attention to the Cardinal. It was only when he began taking countermeasures directly against them that they started paying a particular interest in his activities. It's always it's always an interesting perspective because people love to talk about how full of suffering the Warhammer 40k universe is, and it's definitely true. But I think sometimes they miss the scale, right? Here's a guy who was doing some pretty wild and dangerous shit for a long, long time, and yet... The Inquisition, it was so routine that it never even rose to their radar. So it does make you think, for the vast majority of people, maybe, I mean, you know, are, are their lives... Like, the Inquisition is not something that regular human beings in a typical average world in, you know, the Imperium would even probably contemplate. Right, you could probably start your own tiny religion if your world was obscure enough and you kept it on the DL enough, and the Inquisition probably wouldn't give a crap about it. For after all, the Inquisition is the most forgiving and trusting of organizations. But if you're going to try to keep secrets from them, well, you'd better be really, really good at it because the Inquisition... Ironically enough, considering their own field of expertise, are not particularly fond of secrets. <laughs>
the choice of assassin eventually fell upon the Vindicar Temple. This is an organization of the Officio Assassinorum that specializes in long-range sniping execution, utilizing handcrafted and highly specialized Exodus long rifles. A Vindicar assassin armed with this marvelous piece of military technology, and with a wide variety of highly specialized ammunition at his disposal, is more than able to put an executioner round through a target's head at several kilometers range. Now, a long-range sniping execution might not seem like the most subtle way of taking care of a cardinal, and that was entirely intentional. The Officio Assassinorum has, within its organization, several temples that specialize in different ways of assassination. They could have sent an expert in poisons to try and make his death look like a heart attack, for example. Or they could have sent an info site to try and manufacture some event where the Cardinal would have an accidental death. Perhaps an elevator would malfunction and drop him to his death, perhaps. Or they could send someone considerably more direct, like a raged-infused monstrous killer that would rampage through the Basilica until he eventually reached the Cardinal's chamber, but all of this was of course carefully considered. An accidental death would not send the right message. A accidental yet suspicious death, again, lacked in punch, shall we say, but a mad rage killer butchering his way through a holy place of the Imperium uh, was a little bit too blatant. Instead, they needed a way of assassinating him that on one hand could be denied, plausibly so. I mean, any realistic estimate of the assassination would quite clearly show that this could only have been carried out by an extraordinarily skilled individual, which somewhat shortens the list, shall we say, but nevertheless, that in and of itself is not evidence, and it also had to be blatant enough to send a clear and loud message. Don't get on the Inquisition's radar. This is interesting because this is a real constraint that political assassinations are subject to, because again, Killing an individual can have effects, but individuals are generally not as powerful as the institutions they lead. So you're also, by killing someone, you're sending a message to the institution. So one example might be Russia's willingness to poison one of a, a uh, dissident who was living in the UK. This was several years ago. And it's interesting that Russia chose a poison that it was actually a, a nuclear poison, uh, a derivative of plutonium, I believe, that when injected in the bloodstream cannot be cleared by the body. And so the result is a slow death from radiation poisoning from within. It's a horrible way to die. And a very sort of public way to die. And this was intentional because they wanted to have no dispute over who was responsible, right? And only, I mean, the idea of a manufactured poison using nuclear material very clearly limits the number of actors that can use it. Likewise, the... You know, so so there was a message there that was clearly a signature line, and it was meant for the public, but it was really meant for dissidents, but was still just enough of de deniability, right, that it at least wouldn't get picked up in Russian language media. Now, another an opposite example would be the U.S.'s assassination of. Uh, Kasim Soleimani, the Iranian general. This was done during a visit of his to Iraq, and it was done in pretty spectacular fashion, a precision strike on his car. And it's interesting to me that the U.S. would choose to do so uh, because it sends a couple of messages. First is that Iraq is still a country where the U.S. believes it holds influence and it does not care much 
for Iran's efforts to influence the country, which, by the way, are considerable and have gone on for years. And so killing him in Iraq is very directly sending that message. Also, their ability to target him almost exclusively, right, killing his own vehicle and not the vehicles surrounding him, lets other actors know that on an individual level, the United States is watching you and will target you specifically if the need arises. So again, this is not fiction. This idea that there is a careful message behind these assassination methods. Or you too might meet an untimely end. But before aforementioned abrupt ending to the Cardinal's worldly duties could be carried out, the Ordo Hereticus chosen assassin first had to infiltrate Vrax. Now, obviously, he had no problems with the security clearance because, well, Inquisition. But that still left a fair few hurdles for him to pass before getting within range of the Cardinal. Luckily, due to being a Vindicari, he didn't have to get all that close. And so he infiltrated the Basilica itself, dressed like a pilgrim. During the night of his arrival, he climbed to the top of the highest tower of the Basilica, couched his Exodus long rifle, and made himself as comfortable as he was likely to get, considering he was squatting at the top of a cathedral spire. And with that done, all that remained was to wait for an opportunity. It was going to take several long days of careful observation and waiting, but as the Vindicard assassin knew all too well, if you wait long enough, the opportune moment will eventually arrive. And, just as always, it eventually did. Okay, I just want to point this out. Uh, snipers sitting on the top of high positions that they can't exfiltrate from is a terrible, terrible tactic. And this is for a couple of reasons. The first being, if you're on the top of a tower, it's everyone looks up and sees you. So right there, you are so easily detected, it's almost comical. Second, it's really hard to reposition from the top of a spire. You have to stop what you're doing, climb precariously down and there's just not a lot of other places you can easily move so and of course you can't you are just have such a narrow field of well you have a narrow field of view in the sense that your ability to you have to set up your target, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is that, yes, you can you can see a lot, but you don't, you have to anticipate, right, especially when you're shooting ballistic projectiles over really long distances, you have to get a lot of information about how exactly the air, the rotation of the earth, the wind patterns, even changes in temperature, those things can all make a difference. And so you really can't do it for 360 degrees. You can do it for a small, narrow channel. So again, I'd be curious to know how this guy got stayed concealed for days on the top of one of the most spectacular basilicas in the planet. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but again, it's a work of fiction, I know, and who knows. A single rocket-assisted hypervelocity adamantine jacketed round began its long, yet brief and fiery journey towards its new home, Zaphon's chest cavity. The shot was far from ideal, the Cardinal was a paranoid man, and not without reason. He took great pains to ensure he never walked in any open spaces where, say, a sniper might, for example, get a good shot at him. There was, however, a split moment when he passed through an ornamental archway which provided a straight line from the Vindicari's gun and the Cardinal's heart. Unfortunately, said straight line sent the bullet through a meter-thick ornamental pillar, 
Not itself a problem for a turbo penetrator round who sliced through marble decorations like butter, but it prevented the assassin from firing a shield breaker round. It was a calculated risk, a reasonable one as well. Personal shield technology is extraordinarily rare and usually well out of the reach for even a cardinal. Unfortunately, Zaphon had proved himself to be something quite out of the ordinary for a cardinal, and for a split instant his Rosarius shield generator leapt into violent, sparking life, materializing a gossamer-thin layer of impenetrable shield energy between the cardinal and the bullet. The shield generator robbed the projectile of almost all of its energy, but nevertheless, it cracked several of the cardinal's ribs and sent him sprawling to the ground. But by the time a second and a third round left the assassin's weapon, the cardinal's bodyguards had interposed themselves. The split second opportunity had come, and it had gone. Oh dear. Well. This leaves our would-be assassin in a bit of a pinch. He finds himself on the top of a basilica spire, a basilica, by the way, that is filled to the absolute brim with religious maniacs, in a city filled to the absolute brim with yet more religious zealots, and of course the city itself is surrounded by miles upon miles of bunkers, trenches, minefields, barbed wire, and not to mention, a few thousand soldiers. All of which was entirely irrelevant, of course. The Officio Assassinorum does not train its operatives to give up. The Vindicari began his long journey down and hopefully to some form of escape where he could have another attempt at Zaphon. Unfortunately, there were a lot of people within the Basilica. Like I talked about, shooting people from spires is like a like a video game move right real easy great field of vision and when you can hand wave away the details it makes a lot of sense but if you want to actually do a some sort of sniper type of operation this is not that is not the place to do it you need to be able to leave right because here in this case that guy could really stand to get another a second shot at this cardinal but he can't because he's trapped himself. Unsurprisingly, and it didn't last long before the Vindicari was discovered. And without his pilgrim disguise, it was rather obvious that he didn't belong there. The staff of the Basilica tried to stop him and find out who the fuck he was. Of course, they had no idea of the assassination attempt as of yet, but unfortunately for them, the Vindicari did not have the time to be stopped, and so simply shot anyone that tried to attempt him from leaving. This quickly escalated into a full-on gun battle with the Basilica's guard, which slowed the assassin down enough for the disciples of Zaphon to arrive in force, having located the only possible area that the bullet could have come from. And with the Basilica now swarming with surprisingly well-equipped disciples, there was no escape out for the Vindicari. He had one final desperate gamble, and that was to go underneath the Basilica. What is interesting, and I think is underappreciated, is just how amateurish amateurs are. Um, as we discussed, this is a militia being raised. These are not professionals. These are in seems like most of these cases not even especially well-trained folks so i'm curious and it's it's again i understand it's it's narrative and it makes the narrative really good but people underestimate just how chaotic even well-trained people respond to something like uh, a gunshots going off right so for amateurs to within even a couple of minutes figure out where the assassin is, where the bullet must have come from, rally up forces. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I think it's more likely you should you, you are rarely wrong to err on the side of chaos. Again, there's there's a video out there of uh, US based defense forces. This was probably ten years ago. Um, 
the Taliban driving a suicide van into a gate and then a bunch of uh, armed Taliban enter the base and literally one of the base defenders drives right by them. Not realizing, just not noticing these armed guys right next to them. And the armed guys, of course, are terrified, right? They've, they're looking for soft targets, so they just stay down. But it's, again, it's, it'd be comical if it wasn't like people's lives at stake. Deep into the catacombs, hoping against hope that there would be some form of escape path that he hadn't previously been able to identify. Unfortunately for the Officio Assassinorum agent, the Inquisition had been as effective as they always were. They had identified all of the potential escape routes and none of them were in the Basilica's catacombs. The realization that there was no way out led to a last gunfight between the Assassin and the Disciples of Zaphon, which ended with the Assassin placing his last two rounds in a pair of disciple craniums before two dozens of their bullets found the assassin. The Vindicari's mangled and abused corpse was shortly thereafter paraded through the streets of the city for all to see, as evidence that the enemy had finally arrived. The insidious taint of which the preachers had so vehemently spoken was now clear for all to see. And oh yeah, that's the worst case scenario, man. I mean, a good... I mean, it's hard to conceal a ultra-high-end sniper rifle, um, but I feel like if you were one of these assassins, y you would probably be trained to at least look like, say, a rival religious group or a disgruntled member of another, you know, a, a class of person, right? Maybe one of the people who oversee the slave laborers, right? It, it look like anything other than a highly trained imperial assassin. Again, plausible deniability can sometimes go a long way. And not only that, but it had struck directly at their very messiah. As you can probably imagine, things were about to get a lot worse. And it all started with the now Frateris Militia, made up, of course, again, partially of various workforces on Vrax, but also in... Alright guys, we are actually at almost an hour. This is taking a lot longer than I expected. I didn't think that I was going to have quite this much analysis on just part one of the Siege of Rex. But this is really interesting, and whoever wrote the lore for this definitely fleshed it out, definitely drew so much from the actual history that that this is absolutely something I want to finish out. So I'm going to stop it there. Guys, please be sure to check out the merch store. Uh, I've got it hanging up back there. You can kind of see it. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of cool stuff for sale, and it's the best way to support the channel. Of course, be sure to comment down below if you think I missed anything or if there's other parts to the Siege of Rex that explain some of the confusing parts about this sort of prelude. And check out the second channel. Be sure to follow me on Instagram. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.